All right. So, how many of you guys have actually just read the book of Leviticus and felt like you understood it? Anyone? How many of you guys feel pretty confused when you guys read through, read through Leviticus? All right. How many of you guys find it pretty boring? All right. It's okay. Honest answers, because... I struggle reading through it. I mean, you're, you're reading through it, especially when you just open the first like four or five chapters. It's like there's all these offerings; they all sound the same, and you're just like, "What's going on here? Like, what? It, it's it's a foreign world to us, right?" Leviticus is we, we know this book mainly as a book filled with laws and regulations. It's it's really describing a world that is pretty strange to us. It's a strange world. Uh, not the Pixar movie, but you know, a strange world to us, and and it's it's just you know it, it's 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 a culture that we're just not used to because in modern times we don't necessarily see a lot of these same kind of offerings and sacrifices that were practiced by many of these ancient cultures. Right? And so when we read stuff like blood sacrifices, we read stuff about priests about dietary restrictions I and mean, we're we, we can often think to ourselves like are we pass all this stuff and so many times when we come to a book like Leviticus and many honestly many books in the Old Testament we're, we're asking ourselves what does this book have to do with the Christian faith today and I will argue that it's an extremely important book for us to understand Leviticus provides a, a necessary foundation for why why Jesus had to come. Why Jesus' death on the cross, his atoning sacrifice, it guarantees our salvation. Leviticus explains how that works. Leviticus is necessary because in the New Testament, a book like the book of Hebrews cannot be written. Leviticus is written for us to show us our sinfulness before a holy God. It teaches us about our need for atonement. It reveals to us what it means to walk with a holy Lord. And so this series here, uh, this series, I'm calling the series, I'm telling the series, In the Presence of Holy God, because that's what Leviticus is all about. It's about how do we enter into God's holy presence and remain there? How do we enter into God's holy presence and dwell with a holy Lord? What does it mean to walk with God? Quick rundown of Leviticus. It's the third book of the Torah. Uh, if you guys don't know what the Torah is, it's the first five books of the Bible combined together as one collection that's called the Torah, that's Hebrew. Uh, in Greek, it's called the Pentateuch. So if you see the words like Torah, Pentateuch, they're talking about the same thing, the first five books of the Bible. Um, and so the first five books is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. So that's the third book there. Uh, Numbers and then Deuteronomy. And really, it's written as one book. It's written as one collection, and, and then over time, Jewish, the Jewish people divided it up into five different books, which is what we have today. The author of the Torah, or the author of, and therefore the author of Leviticus, is Moses. Moses, he wrote the first five books of the Bible, and he wrote them for Israel. Well, God wrote the books. But through the penmanship of Moses to Israel, the audience is Israel. If we think about Leviticus, and we think about where's place, uh, first of all, the Pentateuch, the Torah, that book from Genesis to Deuteronomy, really, we, when we think about that, think about it as a story. It's a narrative. It's a narrative that begins in Genesis and ends in Deuteronomy. It's one story. And within that story, it contains regulations and laws, and that's what mainly the book of Leviticus is about. It has regulations and laws, but remember that it's contained within the context of a narrative. So that's important for us. Leviticus takes place then in the narrative at the foot of Mount Sinai. All right, foot of Mount Sinai. Israel left Egypt, or God took them out of Egypt, delivered them from Egypt. They went through a wilderness period, um, and then they arrived at Mount Sinai where Moses went up the mountain, received the Ten Commandments, the golden calf happened there, and and all that. And then Leviticus happens. Leviticus, all the regulations and laws were given at this time. If we think about this for a moment, and where is place within the Pentateuch, within the Torah, Leviticus is the middle book. 
it, it really here it, it's it tells us really how God is supposed to dwell is supposed to live is supposed to walk with Israel and that's really kind of the whole one of the main key points of the first five books is how does God walk with his people when his people are sinful and he is holy how does that work Leviticus being the center of this whole narrative tells us how that works and that's what makes Leviticus so important and even within Leviticus the key chapter is chapter 16 chapter 16 talking about the day of atonement Yom Kippur the day of atonement which happens once a year a day where Israel atones for a sin for that year that day is extremely important for us to understand how does then God dwell with his people? Uh, the quick outline here is that the book is really divided into two halves. The first half talking about how do we enter? How does God people enter to God's presence? Or how does God dwell with his people? Through chapters 1 through 16, we'll see here talking about offerings, about the priesthood, about purification. And then the day of atonement, chapter 16, the turning point in Leviticus. And after chapter 16... The second half of Leviticus is talking about how to dwell then in God's presence. What does it mean to be a holy people? What does it mean to be God's people? And what does that look like? And so this then we see here that we're really talking about what does it mean to be in God's presence? Right? What does it mean to be in God's presence? How to enter His presence and to dwell in His presence. Uh, there are several themes that we're going to cover in Leviticus. <clears throat> Several themes. The first theme that is going to come to us, which we know, is it's the theme of holiness. All right, holiness is the one word that's repeated, I think, over a hundred times in Leviticus. All right, so that, this is a key theme. Uh, Leviticus twenty twenty six says, "You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine." Although the word holy. To be holy. Uh, it literally means to be set apart. So here God says, I am holy and I have separated you. This is what it means for you to be holy. I have separated you from the rest of the world. From all the other peoples. From all the other nations. I am separating you so that you should be mine. That's what it means to be holy. To be set apart. Uh, and it says it is to be cut of a different cloth. Uh, and really the focus here. When we talk about holiness here. In this book, we're talking about the holiness of God. How is God holy? What does that mean for God to be holy? For God to be set apart? Well, we know that God is holy because, well, first of all, He's, he's God. Right? He's, he's not us. He's God. He's not human beings. He's, he's transcendent. He's set apart from His creation. Right? Uh, for instance, God is spirit. He is invisible. He doesn't have flesh. I mean, Jesus Christ later on puts on flesh, but interestingly how God is described, especially in the Old Testament, is He is invisible. He's a spirit. And we are fleshly and physical. So God, in a sense here, He's whole. He's different from us. He's different from His creation. And His holiness really then is, is, is kind of penetrating through all His other attributes. His love is different from ours. His glory is different from ours. His grace, His mercy is different from ours. His wrath, His judgment is different from ours. Because God is holy. He is, he's different. He's set apart. In the book of Leviticus, God's holiness becomes even more pronounced. Because when man sinned, man marred the image of God. Thus, it makes us unclean, defiled. Makes, and that separates us even further from God. God, on the other hand, can never sin. And he is completely pure. Right, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 tells us that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. We're reminded here that we, we are all tainted by sin. But God is, God is perfect. He's pure for what he is. He, you know, he, he's, he's undefiled. And so when you talk about man and God, right? Because God is holy He's pure, he's sinless, and we are not. Man and God become almost like oil and water. You can't mix the two together. They're, 
did, did, like yeah, as much as you try to end up separating, right? Or like like opposing magnets. God's holiness repels man's sinfulness. The second theme we'll see here is about sacrifice. We won't see a lot about sacrifices. We're we're talking about animal sacrifices. We're talking about grain sacrifices. Um, sacrifices or these offerings they were actually commonly practiced during this time. Like I said, this is an ancient culture, um, and you know it's. And when we when we think about offering sacrifices, oftentimes our mind kind of goes to like you know idol worship, right? Uh, there's there's this board game I like playing called a uh, Zokin. Uh, I don't play it too much, but it's, you're you're pretty much offering grain and waste to these Aztec gods, and that's how you get points. Um, I remember the first time I played with my friends, like I won, and they were like, "You, you're an idol worshiper." <laughs> But all, all, all I'm just saying, it's, it's, it's a different culture, and it's a different time, and when we think about sacrifice, when we think about offerings, we tend to think about idol worship. And yet, sacrifice and offerings are listed here in Leviticus. The reason being is because these are practices common to people during the time, meaning Israelites, when they read about this, they understood the purpose behind these things. The idea of sacrifice is not foreign to Israel or to the nations around them. When in order, the reason why these sacrifices exist is because man and God are different. In order to somehow bring the two together, there must be something, a sacrifice made in place for that kind of relationship to exist. But here's the difference. For these pagan sacrifices, they were made to manipulate their gods to accomplish man's own self-serving will. The sacrifices were made in a sense where, God is, where their gods are needed to be pleased. But the sacrifices here in Leviticus ordained by God for Israel, they show not what God needed, but what the people needed, what Israel needed, what we eventually need. The people here, the Israel, needed to offer sacrifices in order to atone for their sins. And that's a huge difference that we must recognize. Which leads to our next theme, atonement. Atonement is huge throughout Leviticus. Atonement is, a recon- is, a, is recognizing that our sins, our sins require requires some kind of some kind of payment and the wages of sin is death atonement reminds us of the seriousness of sin and the only way to atone for our sins is through death which which is why leviticus emphasized the necessity of blood but one key verse in leviticus leviticus 17 verse 11 for the life of the flesh is in the blood and have given it I have given it for you on the altar, on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. The shedding of blood is what gives you life. It reminds us of the seriousness of sin, but it also reminds us of the value of life. That's why these blood atonements are so important. God created living beings that has life. And when we are to atone for our sins, is to recognize that our sins, the wages of sin is death. In order to atone for our sins, you have to take another life. Killing some of these animals, there's no small thing. And yet it's necessary in order to save our souls. And yet we will learn later as we go through the series that even the blood of bulls and goats were not enough. To atone for our sins. It will require ultimately the blood of Christ. You see here another theme. It's a theme of mediation. Or for most commentaries they, they, they say priesthood. The priesthood is a theme. But I get to say that the reason why the priesthood exists is because they're trying to teach us what it means to mediate. What mediation is. How does that work? You see, the priest exists, the high priest exists in order to be an intermediary between Israel and God, right? 
And therefore, the priests themselves, they must be purified, cleansed of their own sin first before they can mediate between Israel and God. Right? And in a way, to come into God's presence, they must clean themselves first and then represent Israel to sacrifice for them. And we'll, again, we'll, we'll study how all that works. But the, another aspect of mediation that we see in Leviticus is that in the same sense, Israel, Israel was God's chosen nation, His holy nation, His kingdom of priests. In other words, Israel must be holy before they can even mediate to be a priest between God and the rest of the nations. The whole point is to make God's name known. And so the high priest here, when we study about the priesthood, is to give us an example of what Israel is supposed to be for the rest of the world. And then we see a theme with the law. And we're going to come across a lot of regulations. Some of, them, some of them are going to be weird. Some of them are going to be, we're going to read it and we're going to be like, you know what, this makes sense. And one of, our main, one of the main interpretive challenges that we will be tackling in this series is how does the law apply to the church today? And I'm not, I'm not going to go into all that now because that will take another 20 minutes. But we will see that as we study through Leviticus. Now, <clears throat> This is kind of really where the sermon is really going to begin. Um, I want us to consider then the heart of Leviticus as we begin this series. The heart of Leviticus. And the heart of Leviticus, I believe, comes with this single question. Who should dwell in the presence of the Holy Lord? Who should dwell in the presence of the Holy Lord? It's at this point when I kind of gave up making more slides. So okay. instead what we're going to do is we're going to just go through a lot of scripture passages. So take your Bibles and turn me first to Psalm, Psalm 15. Psalm 15. <clears throat> Psalm 15 verse 1 gives us this question. Psalm 15, verse 1 gives us this question. It says here, Psalm of David, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Another word for tent is in your tabernacle. Who shall dwell on your holy hill? This question here that we see in Psalm 15, verse 1, this question here is really kind of the, key, the heart cry of Israel. Uh, we see the same question being repeated in Psalm 24. In Psalm 24, uh, verse 3, it says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? You see, our hearts long to be with God. And the question of, of our hearts, the question of Israel, the question that all of humanity should be asking themselves is, how can we come back to God? And stand before him because we're sinful and yet God is holy. See, we need to care about being with God because we are made to enjoy God. We are made to enjoy God. We are, our purpose is to dwell with God and to worship him. I mean, this is really the whole point of creation. Right? The whole point of creation is for God to be worshipped and to be glorified through him dwelling with his people. What's the high point of creation in the seven days? What, what, someone can, you guys can give, throw me an answer. What do you guys, what is the high point of creation in the seven days? Anyone? No one? Hmm? Okay, uh, some people will argue that, and I'll, I'll agree that that's a very, that's a very important point. <laughs> when he, day. I'll say the seventh day is probably the apex part of creation. The Sabbath, the resting. Why? Well, God in, in Genesis. You turn me to Genesis. Genesis chapter two. In Genesis chapter two, it talks about on the seventh day. Verse 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, says here that on the seventh day, God finished his work that he done, and he rested 
on the seventh day from all his work that he has done. And then in verse 3 it says this, God blessed the seventh day. There's no other day where God, he blessed it. I mean, he blessed mankind when he created him. But in terms of days, he blessed the seventh day and made it holy. You see, when God created everything, and on the sixth day, he created man in his image, and all the other animals and vegetation, and, every, and, and they all dwell here on earth. Well, for man, it was just Adam at the time, and created Eve. And then, but at that time, when God rested, what was happening is that there is this enjoyment of creation. An enjoyment of man and God and the presence of God dwelling upon man, dwelling with man, within creation. Creation being the tabernacle that God created. A dwelling place where he and his people can rest. This is a day of satisfaction. It's the high point of creation. And so when Adam sinned, right, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam sinned and the fall of man happened, what happens? Humanity was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, out of paradise. But more importantly, humanity, man and woman, was kicked out of God's holy presence. And the rest of the Bible focuses upon how then, how can humanity return back to his maker? You see, our hearts... All of our hearts, it longs to find its ultimate satisfaction back in the presence of God. I mean, ask yourself, what do you long for in your hearts? What are you searching for? What do you hope for? When you're going back to school, you're going back to your dorms, your apartments, or you're going back to class, what is it that your heart struggles with? If you're struggling with loneliness, you're looking for relationships, intimacy. You're struggling with brokenness. You're probably looking for some kind of justice. You're looking for, people are looking for love, looking for respect, looking for honor. Some people are looking for beauty and glory. Many of you guys are looking for purpose. It's why you're wrestling with what major, what careers to pursue. But all that can be found when we dwell with God. God can give us all that in His relationship. Perfect love. Perfect justice, perfect glory, and a wonderful deep purpose. See, we when we come back to the question, who should dwell in the presence of the Holy Lord, we encounter a problem. Because the honest answer is none of us can. God is holy and man is sinful. And this separation from God is the root of all the problems we see in this world today. Separation from God is really a separation from life itself. I mean, in Genesis chapter 3, turn me there, we see here how death is the result of sin. In chapter 3, <clears throat> chapter 3 verse, uh, verse 19 tells us, that, tells us that man is cursed in this way. He will... By the sweat of your face, Adam, you will, shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Here we see how all of us, our bodies will decay and become dust again. But it's more than that. It's more than that. There is this separation from the Garden of Eden as well, which represents a separation from true life. In, in verse 24, Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 says that God drove out the man and it says drove him out east of the Garden of Eden. And if you study the Genesis, the, the direction of east always represents away from God. Right? It always represents away from God. And when it talks about someone going west, it actually symbolizes them going back to God. Which is why the west coast is a better coast than the east coast. Um, in any case... Um, <laughs> But we go, they're going east. They're going east of the Garden of Eden. And, and it says here that God placed a cherubim, a, an angel, a flaming sword that turned their way to guard what? To guard the tree of life. See, the separation from God is a separation from life itself. And you experience death. And you have restricted access to true life. 
And from this point forward, Genesis, the rest of the story of Genesis, tells us of a story of humanity falling further and further away from God, further away from Eden. Uh, it's, it's as if humanity just got unplugged and this, his battery just slowly starts dying. We encounter the flood. We encounter the Tower of Babel and the scattering of nations. We see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even when we talk about the patriarchs of Israel, right? A Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We see here in Abraham, there, there was given a promise. A promise that, what? A promise that Abraham's descendants will do what? They'll become a great nation. So in a sense, God here is saying, I'm going to create in you a new humanity. And I'm going to bring you to a promised land. This is a counterpoint where God is saying, hey, I know I've cast you out of Eden. This is how I'm going to bring you back, in a sense, to Eden. Back into my presence. The promised land. This, the promised land is the land that images, that echoes of Eden. And yet when we read about Abraham and the rest of his descendants, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, we see that the trajectory of his descendants in, throughout Genesis actually doesn't get any closer to the promised land. In fact, the story of Jacob ends with his bones being buried in Egypt. When we consider this, we consider just through Genesis how far the world has fallen away from Eden, how far the world has fallen away from God. And we consider it in our world today, how much further removed are we since the fall? The brokenness of the world today, the pains that we feel in our hearts, it's all an echo of our longing for paradise, our longing for Eden again. Genesis here provides a backdrop to the rest of the biblical narrative. It presents to us the problem. The problem of sin and how it alienates us from God. But as we come to Exodus, Exodus is providing some hope and a solution to this problem. Again, I'm giving you guys a narrative to show you guys how Leviticus fits in here. And then turn me now to Exodus, and we're, we're going to dig through a few passages here, just to set up the context of the book Leviticus. In Exodus, uh, in Exodus, we see here that God, what? He delivers Israel, right? Now, Abraham's descendants, God's people, they multiply. And Israel now, under slavery and bondage in Egypt, God delivers Israel from the Egyptians, and he does, th does so with, through a spectacular display of his power and control over this world, right? He, we know about the plagues. We know about the Red Sea. But in, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, notice what God is doing with Israel. Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. God says this. He tells Moses, when you go to Israel, tell them this. Tell them that I, God, will take you, Israel, to be my people. And I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. See, God says here, I'm going to save you, Israel. And not only that, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to make you, I'll make you the new, redeemed, true humanity. And I will dwell with you. And we see here again echoes of what life was like in Eden. I will dwell with you. I will be your God and you will be my people. And Israel understood this. In Exodus chapter 15, after Israel crossed the Red Sea, they sang a song, right? The song of Moses, often called the song of the sea. But really, a better name for this is the song of the mountain, the mountain of the Lord. Because in, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 17, Israel sings about this. Sings about their salvation. And they understand that their salvation is meant, to, is meant to bring them closer to God. And it says here, Exodus 15, verse 17, You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. So you'll bring Israel in and you'll plant them. It means they're going to be rooted. They're going to be stable. They're going to, they're going to flourish. Plant them on your own mountain the place, O Lord, which you have made for your, what? Your abode. 
your home, your dwelling, your temple, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The whole purpose of bringing them through all this, the exodus itself, is to make Israel, bring them into God's presence and plant them there. God's promising Israel that He will be with them and they will be His people. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, it tells us how Israel then is to be a holy people, right? Exodus 19, verse 5, it says, If God tells them, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession among all peoples. For all, for the, for all the earth is mine. See, God here, God saying, all creatures are mine, even all the nations belong to me, and yet you, Israel, you will be set apart from all of them. You will be, to me, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel must be set apart from all nations to show that they are not alienated by God. To show that God will dwell with them, God will be with them. Instead, Israel will have God's favor. And this is why, is, after, right after this, God gave them the law. Saying, hey, if you're going to be my holy nation, this is how you're going to live. And then we see the Ten Commandments happen. And there's actually not just the Ten Commandments, but there's other laws too that come after that. But the Ten Commandments is what we best know of. And this is how Israel is going to be a holy nation. And then God gives them instructions. God gives them instructions in Exodus chapter 25 to do what? To build a tabernacle, a sanctuary. And again, already we've seen themes of this tabernacle. Themes that this tabernacle here represents God's dwelling amongst His people. In Exodus chapter 25 verse 8, God says, Let them, Israel, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. The purpose of the tabernacle is for God to dwell amongst Israel. And really the tabernacle is a miniature Eden. It's a miniature Eden. It's supposed to show Israel that there is a way back to paradise. That there is a way back into the presence of the Holy Lord. You see, God created, again, God created heaven and earth, right? God created heaven and earth, and actually the Psalms, uh, the scripture tells us that the heavens and earth, all creation, God created them to be His tabernacle, to live with, with His people. In Psalm 104, Psalm 104 verse 1 and 2, it tells us here that God here, God is clothed in splendor and majesty. He's covering Himself with light as a garment and He's stretching out the heavens like a tent, like a tabernacle, like a dwelling place. God is created every day and again for the purpose for him to be in his creation dwelling with his people that was supposed to be the purpose of the garden of eden scriptures speak of creation as a tabernacle pitched by god for him to dwell in and ever since the fall man has been outcast from this tabernacle man has been outcast from Eden, from God's presence. Uh, it's, it's like as if man lost their membership, right? Lost, lost their Costco membership and being denied at the door, right? Their man here, man here is outcast and man cannot redeem himself. But what we see here in Exodus chapter 25, there's the other point that we see here in Exodus chapter 25 is that when God says to Israel, make for me a sanctuary, make for me a tabernacle, it's not just to show humanity, not just to show Israel, hey, there's a way back to Eden, there's a way back to Paris, there's a way back to me. But God's also saying this. He's saying, hey, I know you can't come to me because you're sinful. But let me do this. By my grace, I will come down to you and I will dwell in your presence. That's amazing. You see, the tabernacle is to represent how God shows compassion for his people. How God is willing to come down 
and live with his people. And, and so as God is leading Israel to the promised land, and God is showing them that this is what it means. It means that I will dwell with you. I will be with you. I will lead you. I will walk with you. I mean, the people, we have to understand that this is the whole point of this. The whole point of the Exodus here is to, for God to bring His people back in relationship with Him. But we know how the story of Exodus goes. Israel sins. They create a golden calf. They did some idol worship. And in Moses, Moses had to intercede for Israel. Look with me at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, verse 15. Notice of how, how does Moses intercede with, for Israel? Look at his words here. Moses says in Exodus 33 verse 15, he, ta- he tells God, If your presence, God, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how is it to be, how is it be known that I have found favor in sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? So that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? See, what Moses is saying here is like, God, God was like, hey, I, I will still fulfill my promise. So that way you, guys can, that way you can see that I'm, I've been faithful to my promises. I will bring you to the promised land, but I won't be with you. And Moses is telling God, no, if you won't be with us, then there's no point of going to the promised land. There's no point of entering the land. Think about that for a moment, even for yourselves. Like, we, for many of us, for instance, we'll still go to Disneyland if Disneyland did not have Mickey in it, right? I mean, who's Mickey? You're not even going there for Mickey, right? Even though Mickey's supposed to necessarily be, I don't know, quote unquote, like the king of Disneyland, if he's not there, you don't see him, you wouldn't care. You'll still go there. But that's not the case with how the promised land was supposed to work. It matters that God is present. That's what makes the promised land the promised land. And it reminds us, even today, that our blessings for God, it's not about the blessings. It's about God. What do you look for when you think about your relationship with God? Are you seeking God himself, or are you only looking for his blessings? Moses recognized that the promised land means nothing without God. And we should too. As Moses intercedes, we then reach the end of Exodus. The tabernacle is built. God relented of his wrath. He did not destroy all of Israel. They reap, they, uh, God gave them again the, the law again. They built the tabernacle. And at the end of Exodus, of the book of Exodus, it says here in chapter 40, verse 35, the start of 34, it says here, verse 34, that the cloud covered the tent of meeting, that's the tabernacle, right? The cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So here God comes and dwells in this tabernacle, this miniature Eden, to represent his presence amongst Israel. But note what it says in verse 35. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meetings because the clouds settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Tabernacle is built. God's glory fills it. He's present. But no one, not even Moses, can approach God. There is still a separation between God and man. And so Exodus ends with this question. How can a holy God dwell in the midst of sinful people? Or to turn it around, who? Who can dwell 
in the presence of the Holy Lord. And that leads us into Leviticus. And Leviticus answers that question for us. To conclude our time here this evening, let's go back to Psalm, Psalm 15. In Psalm 15, we saw in verse 1 the question, the question of our heart. The rest of the psalm answers this question. And the psalm answers it in this way. Right? Who should dwell on your holy hill? This is the person who should dwell. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks the truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and, and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, and whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own herd and does not change, who does not put on his money at interest and does not take out a bribe against the innocents. He who does these things shall never be moved. He will be planted in God's holy hill. We see a similar answer in Psalm 24 to the question that was posed there, right? In Psalm 24, verse 3, the same question is posed. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Verse 4 is the answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Understand what these psalms are saying. The psalms are saying that man, that we, sinful, dirty, lustful, unclean human beings, we have, we can dwell with the Lord if we have clean hands, a pure heart, if we walk blamelessly and righteously. Really, the question of these psalms is asking you, are you close to God? Do you know God personally? Do you know Him in such a way that you are walking closely with Him? Or is God simply a distant figure, a ruler who just simply gives you rules to follow and obey? We can stare at these psalms, and we can look at these questions, and we can think to ourselves, and if we're quite honest to ourselves, when a question like this comes up to us, right? Who can ascend to the hill of God? Really, it's trying to say, us, are you close with God, right? Are you close to God? Do you have a relationship with Him? How deep is your relationship with God? And if someone were to ask you that, if I were to come up to you and ask you, hey, tell me about your relationship with God. Are you close to Him? Do you know Him well? I think for most of us, we would probably try to answer pretty humbly. In the sense that we'd be like, yeah, it can be better. It could be better. And that's true. Because we know that we aren't the cleanest person. We know that our hearts aren't necessarily pure. We know that the righteous life is very difficult to live. We recognize our own weaknesses and our own downfalls. We see our own sins and our ugliness. But turf, collegians, I want to encourage you that you can be holy. You can be indeed distinct and set apart from this world. You indeed can walk a blameless life. And you can do so not because of your own power, but because of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came down to this earth and saved us from our sins. Jesus here, he's the ultimate fulfillment of everything we're going to study in Leviticus. Because in Jesus says in John 14, verse 9, or verse 6, says what? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What does that mean? It says, this is what it means. It means no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the presence of God except through me. No one can come to know God unless you come to know me. 
Jesus is the way because his sacrifice on the cross washes away our sins and purifies our souls. Jesus is the truth because in him we can find true humanity, the true image of God, and we are being conformed, transformed into his image day by day. Jesus is the life because in Christ we can experience blessings upon blessings, riches upon riches. We come to know God who is life personally. But more importantly, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Scripture tells us that we are the temple, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of the living God. And then they quote, Leviticus. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We will study this passage in the beginning when we get to it, but we see the fulfillment here already in Christ. We are the temple of God. Jesus Christ chose the tabernacle. Again, remember, Jesus didn't say, hey, come to me. He says, I will come down and dwell with you. I will dwell amongst my people. I will tabernacle and put on flesh to walk amongst you, to be in Christ, to be part of the body of Christ, to be his temple, is to be in the presence of the Holy Lord. The church is a tabernacle, the sanctuary. The church today, you, are an echo of Eden for the world. And so as we study through Leviticus, we will see how Leviticus ultimately points us to Christ. It will ultimately point us to Christ. And so I want to leave you guys with these few thoughts. I know many of you guys won't be here through our studies in Leviticus. As you can tell, I'm recording my sermon, so you guys want to follow along, you guys can listen to us on our podcast or YouTube. But as we go through Leviticus, I want you guys to think about these things. Leviticus will teach you what it means first for God to be holy. And what that will do is that it will instill a, a seriousness to your faith. It will make you take sin seriously because God takes sin seriously. And so when we think about our sins, we're talking about not just the big sins, but all sins. Even the small sins. Every single sin we must take seriously because God takes it seriously. He is holy. Leviticus, as we go through Leviticus, it will teach you how our salvation in Christ works. It teaches why it works. And what that will do is that it will instill a confidence in your faith. Right? If you are struggling with doubts about your salvation, because perhaps you're wrestling with a habitual sin. Or maybe you just feel like, you know what, I don't think, like I'm not serving in any way, or people seem to ignore me. Like I just don't know if I'm wanted. If I'm not wanted by the church, then maybe I'm not wanted by God. And you have doubts. You're wrestling with your own salvation. You're wrestling with your faith, and there's fear in you. Leviticus, studying Leviticus and seeing how Christ died for your sins atone for your sins, and he died a death that you deserve, that will give you confidence and boldness in your faith. So join us as we study this. And then lastly, Leviticus will teach you what it means to be holy. It will teach us what it means for us to be holy, to be distinct in this world. And what that will do is it will bring joy to your faith. Bring joy to your faith as you understand that walking with God indeed is the fullest satisfaction to our souls. It will show us that obedience to God, obedience to God should not feel like a wearisome task. I mean, there are times where it is indeed tiring, but there is so much joy and satisfaction in obeying God. We will see how wisdom in God, wisdom in Scripture, following that, leads you to true fruition of life, a flourishing life, a prosperous 
prosperous life. And we'll see that obedience in God indeed is a good thing. And so then who should dwell in the presence of the Holy Lord? Guys, because of Christ, we can. Remember that. As we study through Leviticus, think about what that means. Think about what that means for you to be saved by Christ and to walk with Him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And I know I got I went through a lot of scripture passages, but really I, I want to settle Leviticus well because Leviticus can sound very tedious, it can sound very boring. It's filled with just things that can confuse us. But I want us to see that your word here, ultimately what it does is it points us to your son. And it shows us who Jesus is. It shows what he's done to the cross. And what it does is it opens our eyes to your glory and to your beauty. God, I pray that, Lord, that we will come to enjoy you more and more so. That, God, your life, your life will become our joy. And, Lord, I pray, Lord, as we as we consider our lives then, our faith and our walks with you, we consider then what it means to be in your presence and how that should give us just ultimate satisfaction, complete satisfaction, contentment before you. So Lord, I pray that you just be with the cleaners here. Many of them will be going off again, back to your dorms, back to your schools, different states across the coast. I pray, Lord, that you remind them as they go off that they are the temple of the living God. And that, Lord, you are dwelling with them. You are walking with them. And that, Lord, you, you are their God. And they are your people. And so, Lord, I pray that they'll remember that and they'll be encouraged by that. And they will continue to seek you out. Seek you out in prayer. Seek you out through the through your word. Seek you out in community. Seek you out in, in obedience. And that Lord, you will come and experience your love and your grace and your blessings. Father, may we continue to live the life that's pleasing to you. And by pleasing you, Lord, may we also then experience the greatest joy and satisfaction that we can ever know. Thank you again for your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray all this in your name. Amen.